and welcome back to Fertility Talks, the Therapy Fertility Podcast. I'm your host, Renee Von Medding, and this season I'll be sitting down with none other than the Medical Director of Therapy Fertility, Dr. John Kennedy. Each week, we will be chatting all things fertility, trying to conceive, and much, much more. We hope that through this series, through honest conversation and information, we can strip away some of the stigma that sometimes comes hand in hand with infertility and fertility treatment in Ireland. This week, as we near the end of season one, John and I are going to be taking a look back at some of the things we've discussed over the last few weeks and months on Fertility Talks. We've chatted about everything from infertility and the causes of this to options for family building for members of the LGBTQ plus community. So yeah, we're just going to have a bit of a chat and kind of have a look back really. Wow, great stuff. So yeah, uh, I've been racking my brains trying to think what do we talk about? What do we not talk about? What did I miss? What did I miss? What have I not talked about? We've covered a lot, I think. We've, we've covered a lot through male, female timing of testing testing and then treatments we've gone into kind of ad nauseum um i'm happy to be led by you on this um yeah so i think what we'll do is we'll just kind of maybe take a quick look back at like okay. the the different topics so let's start with infertility so again we won't go too in depth on mm-hmm. on on this because i'm assuming at this point most people have listened to each of the episodes oh, absolutely, and if yeah. you haven't please go back <laughs> yeah, now right. and yeah. listen to episode yeah. one um but let's just kind of take a, a quick look back so yes what is infertility what's it defined as what's it caused by okay so broadly speaking it's being not getting pregnant for after you've been trying for uh, over six months uh, or over a year if you're under 35 and over six months if you're over 35. So we, we call it a bit of a Rubicon at 35 years old. One in four, one in five couples struggle a little bit to conceive when they're trying. 90% of couples conceive in the first year of trying, 95% in the first two years of trying. Natural conception rates, best natural conception rates are about 17. That's one seven percent, which is always lower than people think. It's very low. It's you would never think that. Absolutely. But it, that accumulates, you know, so it's month on month on yeah. month. Um, now, I mean, anecdotally, everybody would believe that's either much lower or much higher, but that's maybe where yeah, the yeah. number spits out. At. Half the time, it's there's a male factor involvement. Half the time, there isn't. There's loads of different causes. Um... Things like endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, irregular cycles, age, ovarian reserve. These are all big factors. Most of the time, while we might have an idea of what's a contributory factor, a lot of it is just unknown, Mm. still unexplained. And all the bits seem to be working. The tubes seem to be open. You seem to be ovulating. The sperm are there. We don't know why you haven't gotten pregnant. Uh, It might just be bad luck. Yeah. Somebody has to fall into that 10% or 5% bracket for no reason other than just dumb bad luck. Yeah. So the question becomes, when do you try? When do you test? We know that people are starting their families later. This is a drum I bang all the time. People are starting in Ireland, starting their families early 30s, 32, 33 years old. And we know that while you hold your fertility as a broad trend up to the age of about 34, if you've got a most of the population having children in their 30s as opposed to in their 20s or even their late teens which is physiologically probably when we're designed to then a higher proportion of people are going to run into problems or just get delayed so it's classed as an illness it's classed as a disease disease yeah the world health organization defines it as, as as a disease which i think is very useful should be more powerful than it is um but it does mean that uh technically resources should be given to this as they are to any disease. I was just thinking about that actually because so I was listening back to that, that episode where we talked about this at, at great length and it's kind of crazy that there isn't any kind of assistance like state assistance for those suffering a disease because for every other like name me a disease and there's assistance yes. for it yes. correct? Absolutely so the problem is once you start and let me preface this by saying I am wildly absolutely and totally in favor of proper public funding for fertility services yeah. of course i am once you start paying for something it's very difficult to stop paying for it mm. especially in healthcare and healthcare is a bottomless black pit 
So what you do, what's embarrassing isn't the fact that we don't pay for public fertility, public fertility care in the sense of IVF cycles or even IUI cycles. It's that other countries do and we don't. The only yardstick, you, you're never going to eliminate disease altogether. Mm. Any disease is very, very difficult. You're not going to eradicate. You're not going to suddenly prevent all heart attacks. So how much money do you pour into preventing heart attacks? Mm. And honestly, and people don't like to hear this, what you do is you look to see what your neighbours are doing. Mm. You look to the countries nearest you, the countries with similar GDPs. You look at, are you a developing country? Are you a developed country? And you look at the yardstick. We saw this in spades with cervical cancer. Mm that you're never going to eliminate it completely. The screening program is going to miss cases. It's designed that way. It has to. So how do you determine if your screening program is truly effective or not? You look and see what international rates are and you compare yourself to that. Now, in the sense of fertility, we're doing astonishingly badly because we're not putting anything into it. Now, what you will notice is a trend across Europe where money is slowly being pulled out of it. And I think it was really telling. There was an interesting article in the paper maybe two weeks ago, I don't know if you saw it, there was a massive, in the UK, there was a massive shortage of blood tubes. Mm. They couldn't get them. It was something to do with Brexit. The, the, they had one single supplier. The company that makes the tubes that you draw blood in had not made enough of them and there was a critical shortage. So they said, we can keep processing essential bloods, but non-essential bloods should not be performed. Mm-hmm. There were two areas they identified as being non-essential. The first was wellness testing. That's, you know, allergy testing, mm. not quite allergy testing, but but uh, nutritional testing sure. and levels of vitamins and things like that. And the other was fertility under 35. How is that non-essential? Of course, you know, but what they're saying is they're saying, right, it's a disease. Absolutely. And, and you, you'll get a lot of lip service in this space of people saying, um, my heart goes out to people who are struggling with fertility and have fertility issues and, and need need assistance and need it. And there's generally a big long sentence. And that, that old rule of thumb, the more you say before the word but, the worst thing that <laughs> comes after the word but is yeah, going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So generally you get this huge big preamble and then there's a but. Mm. And then you turn to what about it? You talk about critical healthcare shortages. You talk about massive waiting lists. You talk about overcrowding in A&E. You talk about COVID. You talk about the stress and the strains on, on, the, on the health services. And then you say, now is not the time. And then you wait till there's an election year. And then you promise there'll be public funding mm. and that is going to be there. And there's a plan. Like I've seen it. We've all seen the plan for legislation. We've seen the proposed kind of plan for public funding. It's We were all, all the people who were involved in fertility clinics were invited into the Department of Health, oh, it would have been about three years ago, to talk about what a public funding model would look like. And the first question we all asked was, how much money are you putting into this? And mm. the answer was, we haven't decided that. We just want to know how much. Well, like, we need all the money. Like, nobody's ever going to say, oh, you've given us that, that's enough. Because yeah. then you'll cover IVF for how many cycles? One cycle, two cycles, three cycles. Will you cover it for people who are 35, 36, 37? Will you have entry requirements? Will you have BMI entry requirements? Will you have age-based entry requirements? So what you do is, and it's an awful thing to do, you start off with your pot of money. And you say, right, we're going to give you 100 euro. That 100 euro, for simple mathematics sense, hmm. will buy five IVF cycles somewhere. We can, if only. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know. Yeah. But let's pretend. Let's pretend it will buy five somethings, five bars of chocolate. Sure. So you now have to decide who gets those five bars of chocolate. Are they the most deserving people? Are they the people most in need? Are the people who've made the most effort? Mm. If you're a smoker, do you deserve one of the bars of chocolate? Mm. Or, or what have you? So... What you want, you don't ever want to say that. You want to go, there's bars of chocolate for everybody. Yay, as much chocolate as you want. But the simple fact of the matter is you've got to fund this. And with the best will in the world, the public sector is not set up to deliver IVF. Um, they could get there. Of course they could. It's all things are possible. But it would take time. Mm. And there's been historically quite a disconnect between obstetrics and gynecology and fertility in Ireland. It's just the way the training works, the way the structure works, they haven't really been joined up. I'd love to see them more joined up. I'd love to see more collaboration between between these, between these centres. A lot of that is because most fertility services, not all fertility services are 
private enterprise led and there has been historically a disconnect between the private healthcare sector and the public healthcare mm. sector um you need to bridge that and you need to change that but that all takes time and there's no use in telling somebody look we're planning to get publicly funded ivf and there's going to be great services available in five years time that's useless to them it's useless to anybody and in fact, every single time, every time it's coming up to an election year, a kite gets flown. Mm. I've seen three happen three or four times already now where, oh, we're going to have publicly funded uh, health care and IVF uh, next year. And it's a disaster each time because what you see is a drop off in people engaging with treatment and yeah, testing. because they're waiting and they're course, hoping. They're waiting and, and they're by hoping. By the time and it comes around and it actually doesn't happen, and it just then turns they've out lost to be time. They've lost time. And so it, it almost breaks your heart. You go, please, mm. please stop but politicians are going to politicians so i i, I get why I, I i see it but i it is shameful that we don't have a better publicly funded system it's shameful that we are under utilized as regards the per capita levels of ivf were low in ireland compared to the rest of europe and that's because of access and it's because mm -hmm. of affordability and it's because people are pouring their life savings into it. So it's not got anything to do with we have lower rates of infertility. It's oh God, no. surely oh God, just no. that people no, no, we're can't just, yeah, afford we're just, yeah. to yeah. Yeah. do people, anything about yeah, it. They travel. We know a lot of people travel for fertility care. Um, they beg, they borrow, they... Uh, you see, like, when you actually take the time and effort to ask how people, how they're financing cycles of, of fertility treatment, it's savings. It's denial of holidays and things like that. Denial of holidays, I can cope with. Mm. I can't, you know. Uh, a lot of it is funded through extended family. Mm. Um, and certainly, I think what happens is people don't plan for multiple cycles in the main. Yeah. They plan for the first cycle. And if that doesn't work, then they really want to do another cycle. It's medically, it's a reasonable thing to do another cycle. And what do they do there? Now, I'm not saying the situation is brilliant elsewhere. All right. We've had, I've seen an awful, even in the last few months or two, last few months, I've seen an awful lot of patients from Northern Ireland who are on waiting lists for treatment there. And they've been told it's going to be a year. You're just in the system now. It's going to be at least a year mm -hmm. before you get a cycle with us. And so they're, they're coming to see me. They're coming to see us in an effort to try to Get, get across the line faster. Yeah. Makes perfect sense to me. So all the trusts and across Europe is a general trend. The tap is slowly being turned off, not mm. on for fertility services. So they're playing catch up to the rest of us. Yeah. So I suppose that's why it's kind of important what therapy fertility are doing is just making it that little bit more affordable, that little bit more accessible. Oh, I think so. I mean, I, th I think it's going to... I don't want to even speak in commercial terms, not broadening the size of the market. It's just mm. fertility clinics traditionally, as a fertility specialist, I've thought that these are the people who do fertility treatment. No, these are the people who can do fertility treatment. There's a whole host of other people who want to do fertility treatment, but who can't. Mm. I, I acknowledge, accept, understand and agree that fertility, infertility is a disease. No mm. question about it. The treatment of infertility, the treatment of subfertility, you don't, it shouldn't be walled off. There should be conversation. There should be choice. And now you get into the social egg freezing. Do you have to earn your IVF cycle? If you're 33 years old and you've been trying for eight months, is it reasonable for you to do IVF? All the other things are equal. Or should you have to wait? Now, that's the chocolate bar scenario. That's where you kind of go, no, look, we're going to make you jump through these hoops before we give you a free cycle, you know, before we are at least financially a free cycle. But I love the notion that people can take control and ownership of their own fertility destiny if they want to get pregnant faster than um, then they have this option to say nothing, of course, of the cohort. We still haven't come up with a good term. <laughs> And I'm putting that I was on you. I'm waiting for you to come back to this. I'm putting that on you. Um, the people I've traditionally called reproductive choice, because everybody knows that being gay is a choice. And if you just decide not to be gay, then <laughs> you'd be fine, right? Damn it. <laughs> Someone had told me this a few years ago, we'd be richer. <laughs> there's a camp. There's lots of options. <laughs> Look. Uh, so what's 
hilarious is you could be in a situation where you could have a same-sex female couple, but let's say they're 33 years old, side by side with a heterosexual couple who are 33 years old, and the female couple are eligible for fertility treatment, which is going to be covered by the state, but these guys aren't because mm. they haven't gone through a year of infertility. Yeah. Now, how do you square that circle? Yeah. You know? Um, so, so nobody's really thought this through. Yeah. And... You just know that when they put it out, there's going to be a backlash. Yeah. Because uh, there always is. What about ism and straw man? And you'll yeah. see a lot of that kind of kind of noise. The simple fact of the matter is you just have to pony up and deliver the service. Hmm. You really do. Um, I need a better name. I still don't know what to write down. We're accepting. <laughs> We're accepting ideas, folks. <laughs> Because um, look, I so always the, so the traditional one is called like so social infertility, yes, which is the one I've heard a lot, which kind of doesn't sound very nice. Um, it's also so using that, the word infertility, yeah, and so that would encompass, um, you know, people who need the assistance of donor sperm, essentially. So whether you're a same sex couple, clients, you're not a, patients, serve you're that a, position. you know, a single single person who wants to get pregnant yes um that would be the term but yeah it's not infertility but i like the idea of the word choice in yeah. there and i'm not saying you've chosen no but we are a same sex couple or we're lesbian choosing, or, no, but yeah. we're choosing you're to, choosing to have it to start your yeah, family yeah, yeah. So and that's, we're making a choice to use donor sperm to do so but when you say reproductive choice which then would work it, it just has a different <laughs> connotation. A connotation yeah. To it. yeah. So, so something to do with um, fertility choice or. And I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, yeah. I, I want to come up with something a little bit punchy as well. We're going to coin something and we're going to oh, make yeah. big money. Oh, yeah, John, absolutely. You and me. Yeah. <laughs> step two, question mark. Step three, profit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Let's, let's Sorry. <laughs> dial it back. When we're talking about infertility, mm -hmm. The options for treatment are? Okay, three. There's three ways you can get pregnant using your own eggs and your partner's sperm or donor sperm. There's trying yourselves. They're With like timed in intercourse. Or right. not, or you just know, or trying. just intercourse. Or then the, the subheadings in that are time section intercourse, ovulation, induction, mm. follicle tracking, loads of different names. Then there's intrauterine insemination. And then there's IVF or its cousin, ICSI. That's it. Um, everything else is just little tweaks and revisions on them. And the, are all th these things that, that can be done in conjunction with therapy? No. no. We do not do ovulation induction. We do not do timed inter time sexual intercourse. We do not do follicle tracking. Why not, you may ask? Mm -hmm. These things certainly have value and they have a place and they have a role. That place and that role is for people who have irregular or anovulatory cycles for women who are not ovulating because of whatever. The most common reason is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And giving those people some medication to track that and get them ovulating can be a really clever, lo-fi, simple way of getting them across the line. It's great. It's a great thing to do. So why aren't we doing it? Because there's, there's limits to what people should do. I, I, find my, I find myself over the last few years just narrowing my focus more and more and more. You can't be all things to all people. I used to be an obstetrician, a gynecologist, and I did loads of gynecology and loads of surgeries and I did loads of obstetrics and delivering babies and doing all that. And then gradually you move down, you subspecialize and you still talk to a lot of people go, I want to do that, but I also want to keep my hand in with my surgery. Go, no, look, focus on the thing that you really got to do that. So then you go, okay, I'm going to be a fertility specialist. I'm just going to do fertility. I'm not going to do major gynecological sur sur surgery anymore. I'm not going to deliver babies. I'm just going to focus on fertility and be brilliant at that. And that's fantastic. And then you find yourself doing that. And then you find yourself doing and delivering to patients, follicle tracking, ovulation reduction, timed intercourse, IUI, IVF, ICSI, IMC, PGS, donor sperm, donor egg, reciprocal IVF, screening for surrogacy. And it's just, hang on a minute. You can't, not just as an individual, but as an organization, the wider, you, the wider your focus, 
the more this, diluted it, it, it is and you have to accept that and nobody wants to accept that everybody wants to think we can add that in and still be equally brilliant at everything but it's really really hard so what we've decided from the outset and i hope we can hold the line for a while at least we're just doing the things that we want to be brilliant at iui ivf ICSI, egg freezing sperm freezing testing reciprocal ivf yeah. okay we can use donor sperm and that's it and by keeping the focus really tight in terms of our processes and our protocols and what we offer we can we can be brilliant at that and there's that other old saw go hard or go home um i very much want our patients engaged i want buy-in with my philosophy people who come to therapy fertility i want them to buy into the philosophy that you come in you hit the ground running you work hard and you get the hell out as quickly as you possibly can mm -hmm. there's a huge space for being compassionate and caring and actually you know giving a crap about the outcome and i very much do but if you're thinking about it functionally the less time you spend engaging with high-end fertility services like fertility ivf clinics the better off you are yeah and so go in work hard get out there's plenty of organizations in places that are really good at delivering follicle tracking and time of course and if you not go off there and if it doesn't work come to me yeah if, if if you need the help come to me and my focus will be tighter narrow uh efficient and effective that's the logic sounds good to me yeah. um let's talk very quickly about testing i know we did a whole mm -hmm. episode very in depth on testing but just very quickly um what are the kind of uh, male female test options <clears throat> so break it down egg sperm and housing eggs are a finite resource now, housing is not somewhere that you live unless you're an embryo <laughs> a womb with a view yes um <laughs> boom, boom, we need to start getting t-shirts printed uterus yes <laughs> um so the uterus the the eggs and the sperm that's what you need to make a happy healthy baby eggs are a finite resource you start off your life with your complement of eggs as you get older you use them up the average age of the people running out of eggs at is 44 years old testing for egg reserve that is egg quantity not egg quality is via two major means one is a blood test an amh which if you've heard this podcast at all you will have heard me banging on about before the other is a scan of the ovaries looking at this number of small follicles called an antral follicle count scan that's how we assess the quantity of the eggs how do we assess the quality of the eggs the short answer is we don't ivf is a test as well as a treatment by taking eggs out and turning them into embryos that is the test of the quality of those eggs Test of sperm, looking at the count, the movement and the appearance of the sperm. We know sperm counts are dropping. We're a little bit less certain about why. There are secondary tests that can be done on sperm, looking at the fragility of the DNA within the head of the sperm. Some sperm are really sensitive to lifestyle, diet, supplements, alcohol, smoking, exercise, etc., etc. But it's easy for us to look at how many sperm there are there. The last step is the womb, the tubes and the ovaries. The tubes, the fallopian tubes, connecting the womb to the to the ovaries, and we assess that by seeing, making sure the tubes are open, which is not a particularly sophisticated test and does not absolutely tell us that the tubes are functional, merely that they're open. And looking at the womb, looking at the size, the shape, and the contour of the womb, looking for any lumps or bumps or polyps or fibroids, any irregularities that could contribute to failure or miscarriage. There's loads more to it than that. There's other tests and bits and pieces, but at the core of it, that is what the testing is designed to look at. And if all those bits are in place and there's nothing other terrible going on in the history, then you've got a good shot. One thing we're not not so not good at, but one thing that we don't do a whole lot, not as much as you would think, is in offsetting the risk of pregnancy loss and miscarriages mm. and things like that. And we know that most miscarriages are down to embryo quality and there are various ways you can test embryos pgs or pgta as it's been called now is a way of genetic but even that's not perfect mm. it really isn't it's still entirely possible to have a miscarriage despite putting back a, a euploid or normal embryo so i think that's one thing that we see we still see a fair bit of that we kind of struggle with a little bit in fertility is people who are having miscarriages mm. and why that's happening and you do the usual checks you check the anatomy you look at the housing 
but a lot of the time it's just a question of rolling the dice and seeing seeing how to, how to get across the line but that's the testing um and the testing at therapy fertility is not part of the actual treatment package it's no. a separate thing it is of course because the testing is there to determine what you should do mm. it goes history and if you testing, actually want treatment. to do it Absol- once you're presented with absolutely like, so, a so, chance of success or so some, so i will generally at some point in every single consultation i have stop and go what do you guys want to do mm. and you get a range of answers the most common answer is we want to have a baby mm. and i'll go okay when do you want to do this? as soon as possible i go well that's dangerous okay so you know and you you kind of go right what are your expectations in this what what are my expectations in this? What do you think we're going to accomplish? What do I think we're going to accomplish? Are those numbers close together? Uh, and seeing how we can balance all of that out. But testing is vital. Um, fertility treatment, as I've said before, as I will say again, is fraught. It's difficult. It's harrowing. Uh, so you want to make sure you're doing the right thing to the right person at the right time. And these tests well, look, I mean, some of them are just absolutely necessary. I can't proceed without these results. Uh, the results will absolutely change my management. Sometimes you might have a fair idea of what's going on, but tightening that as much as possible so you can really say, look, I think there are challenges here. I think this is reasonably positive. I think you've got a good shot. I think you have a bad shot is, 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 is how we go about doing these things. So testing, yeah, it's not treatment it's something that has to be done before treatment. As we've mm-hmm. said before, if you've had the test done before and they're still current, we'll accept them. Don't need to reinvent the wheel. Which just makes sense because, yeah. you know, why would you put someone through unnecessary testing? Yes, absolutely. If it's not needed. Yeah. Okay. So I think by now, again, people <laughs> very much would understand the difference between an IUI cycle to an IVF ICSI cycle, yep. but just very, very briefly. Break it down. IUI is turkey basting. It's the act of uh, giving somebody, a woman, some medications, a combination of tablets and injections to recruit one or two follicles containing one or two eggs in total, no more than two, uh, triggering the release of those eggs. And when we know they're being released, taking a sperm sample, either partner or donor sperm, and gently putting it in at the top of the womb, shortening the journey the sperm has to make to get to the egg. The idea is that it carries an equivalent success rate to natural fertility, mm-hmm. maybe slightly higher in some cases. So it's good in the sense that it's cheaper and easier than IVF. It's bad in the sense that it's less successful than IVF. Mm-hmm. And it's also bad in the sense that if it works, brilliant. If it doesn't work, you're in the same situation as if you hadn't done it at all. So it's not a test in the same way that IVF is a test. Exactly. Then IVF is a process of giving medications to take eggs, eggs that were going to be lost that month anyway, taking them out. And a lot more than one or two, hopefully. Hopefully. And that is key. You're trying to manage the expectations by looking at the ovarian reserve beforehand, trying to get a flavor of what kind of range will we fall in. Are we in the 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, 20 plus sort of ranges? Don't always get it right, but we try taking those eggs out, IVF, leaving them in a, in a dish with sperm, ICSI, injecting the sperm into the egg to make embryos, grow those embryos out for five days and then start transferring or freezing the embryos however we see fit. So, and then ICSI is just IVF, but with the addition of... The injection of the yeah. sperm into the egg, yeah. which you would do for a male factor or if there'd been previously low fertilization. Although I think people who've done IVF where the sperm is completely normal and there's a low fertilization rate, but there was good binding, we all tend to do ICSI. We'll, oh, we'll do ICSI next time. But there's always that little voice in the back of my head going, look, John, ICSI is not going to... Yeah. You're, you're, you want to be very careful about over-promising and under-delivering. Yeah, sometimes it's just bad luck. Sometimes it's bad luck or egg quality. Yeah. 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 Okay, so then if we're looking at the options for, say, single people or members of the LGBTQ plus community, what are the options there? So they would be the same. So it's either IUI or IVF with donor sperm. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody uh, comes in, not everybody, but a lot of people who haven't done a lot of reading on this come in going, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm a client, not a patient. I'm just coming in for service acquisition, but I want to do this in a responsible and correct way. So clearly I'm going to do IUI. That makes perfect sense. Now, there's a challenge with that. And one of the challenges in that is the cost of donor sperm. 
donor sperm is not cheap. You're mm-hmm. looking at seven or eight hundred euro at least for each vial of donor sperm. Mm-hmm. And if you're doing IUI, you'll need to do at least three IUIs to get to the same success rate as one IVF. IVF and you're going to have to buy three times as much donor sperm. So that can ramp so up your costs. might actually just make more sense to... Financially, just purely financially, it probably costs much the same to do one cycle of IVF with donor sperm as it does to do three IUIs mm-hmm. with donor sperm. If you're young, you're healthy, and you've got good numbers, and we're going to get a decent number of eggs, you probably have a substantially higher chance of having one baby, if not more than one baby, with one completed round of IVF with donor sperm than three IUIs with donor sperm. So while I wouldn't ever dream of standing somebody's way, if they said, look, numbers are fine. That's what we want to do. Wouldn't fall yeah. out if you want to do IUI. Given that you're taking injections either way, uh, I'm not trying to steer people towards IVF. Mm. I'll put my hand up and go, it's my bias. But I'll break down why it might be that case. And I've had a number of couples over the last few weeks who've come in saying IUI and left going, well, that makes sense. You go, no, no, don't decide today. Go away. Think about it, please. Yeah. Just digest what I've said here. But genuinely, when we're having these conversations, is honestly just with the person's best interest at heart. Mm-hmm. Because I often say, it, I feel like such a used car salesman when you're in there going, I know you want to do IUI, but let me tell you why you should do IUI. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, there is a reason here. And it's to do with yeah. your efficient, effective success rate in a timely and cost effective manner. Yeah. Um, and then obviously there's reciprocal IVF, which we did a, a whole episode on. I don't recall. <laughs> um, yes and that's just again for me from my point of view that's just IVF with somebody else's name yeah that's the, the yeah. like from a purely and of course I appreciate the social elements of it but from my point of view it's just pure pure mechanics you yeah, can put the just, embryo back wherever yeah okay so um, we're going to have a quick recap on some of the facts that we are getting asked quite a lot and one of those is can people move embryos to therapy fertility? Still getting asked. We aren't taking embryos from other clinics at the moment. It goes back to what I was talking earlier about simple process lines and coordinated processes and not being at the mercy of delivery, couriers, paperwork, other clinics and all the rest. Um You've gone, I think, genuinely, I think the fertility clinics in Ireland are are very good. Mm. They really are. Um, I think they give you a fair shake. I think people have good experiences and people have bad experiences. That's entirely understandable. I think if you've gone to the time and effort to make embryos in clinic X, use them. Use yeah. them. I mean, really, uh, it always breaks my heart a little bit when somebody comes in and they have an embryo there and go, no, that embryo is just never going to work and I just want to start again. You go, okay, yeah, you can, but would you not make it a wall or a door? Would you not just resolve the situation? Because it's got to eat away at you a little bit. It it, it really does. Uh, they obviously don't want to let the embryo demise thought out, but at the same time they don't want to use it and I think it's a terrible halfway house to be stuck in I would mm. really encourage people if you've made embryos use them if you don't have any embryos and you want to talk about fertility options hell find us we're good people to talk to so what if you already have X amount of children and you still have embryos left what is your advice then John do you know do you, do you I say had, just keep using them I had a call today with an old patient of mine uh, who was wondering she's listening to the podcasts um but who has embryos left has a child and is wondering what to do she's 47 now um and she reached out to me and i gave her a call and i had a chat and i said look there's only one question here do you want more children or not mm. um and then you have to dig into it a little bit more she has a child and you've got to look at the reasons why especially if you have embryos left why you might want another child. And you have to be very clear, and I've had conversations where, well, I think my son, I think my daughter deserves a sibling. Deserves, needs, wants, you know. And I have asked, well, well, what do you want? And I remember getting one really honest uh, answer to that. A number of years back, we said, oh God, no, I hate it. (laughs) I hate it. Everything about it. Hated the child or the pregnancy? I hated the process. I hated the pregnancy. And I wasn't too fond of the child for the first two years either. (laughs) Like, at least she was honest. Yeah. I mean, that made a lot of sense to me. So she was doing this purely because she felt that her child was growing up, Mm. deserved or needed a sibling. Now, the children born of couples 
who have gone through fertility treatment, in the main, there are exceptions, of course, but if you look at every non-emotional metric, if you look at healthcare, housing, and education, they're fine. These are not the children you need to be worried about. Mm. These are wanted children who will enjoy every opportunity to be the best version themselves they can be. Mm. They're going to get socialized in creche. They're going to get socialized in school, on play dates, all the rest of it. They don't need siblings. Mm. It's nice, but certainly I wouldn't dream of recommending inflicting a pregnancy on somebody who didn't want it. And a whole extra reason. human. <laughs> and a whole, like, just for that, for that one reason. So I think while your desire to have a sibling for your, for your child is important, it needs to be allied with the desire to have more children. For you. yourself mm. now that sounds like a simple question but you know it's not an easy one to answer it's very difficult to not fall into the middle ground trap we'll just leave them there let's just avoid thinking about that let's just avoid making that decision now what will put pressure let's say there was somebody and they had some embryos left over and they had two children say theoretically, <laughs> theoretically speaking as those children get older that becomes tenser and tighter yeah because you need to make a call on you it you need to make a call on it. and i also think you need to be people need to be very honest with themselves and we see this in fertility all the time it all sounds fine until you get told what you can't have yeah and you see that in fertility all the time where you have people and they mean it and they believe it I know it mightn't work, I'll be okay, all the rest. And there is a time when that is true, mm. where after you do a cycle and it doesn't work, when you go through your grief and you resolve that and then you emerge out from the other side comfortable that you've done everything you can do. But make no mistake, if you go in thinking, uh -huh, I'll be okay if this doesn't work and I'll just you know, be accepting of that immediately, that is desperately unusual. Mm. That is desperately unusual. Much more commonly is, oh my God, this failure of this process here and now has really illustrated to me how badly I actually want this. And then and, that poses a whole other question of, are we going to start again? And, uh, ha, so it's a can of worms. Mm. It's not as simple as, as you might first think. And it does take conversation. It does take thinking. And people go, oh, just honest dialogue. Like, that's easy. You know, mm. it's very difficult. But so... The questions you have to ask yourself if you have embryos is, is my family complete? Mm. If it happened, it happened. If it didn't, it didn't. But be honest with yourself. And the thought exercise I will often pose to patients, especially when they're thinking about, say, something like egg freezing or um, they're thinking about having children at some point, maybe, you're, and, and you do the test and the ovarian reserve comes back low, maybe quite low, not critical low, but quite low. What I've often said to patients, you should be really careful with this. You get, this is not the case. But as a thought exercise, what if you were told, and you'll never, it'll never be this clear, but what if you were told you have one year to have a child and after that, it's not going to happen. Now, that is never actually the case. We're never that clear. We yeah. can't be. Yeah. But as a thought exercise, it's really useful to try to get yourself into the mindset. And I was talking to somebody last week who had been given a diagnosis i think of celiac disease or something a little bit weirder one yeah. something not weird wonderful but something that she had walked out of that consult they'd mentioned something about fertility to her whatever way she misheard and she acknowledges fully that she misheard she walked away from that consult thinking she could not have children oh, wow. but that was now a week or two later she suddenly realized oh that's not yeah, the yeah, case yeah. at all i've got loads of options and she does have loads of options but, she, but for her, almost, she was given a really useful opportunity to see how she felt in that world. Yeah. We should all be so lucky, not for it to be permanent, but just to be able to throw our minds into that space of what if I was told this is it? It's now or never. What if I was told it's never going to? How would I actually feel? Because none of us really know yeah. until we're confronted with that reality. Yeah. And then you could feel very differently to what you thought you would. Exactly yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay. One of the other uh, really common questions, and again, it's because I think maybe some other clinics um, do not have kind of the same stance on this is, is there a cutoff for people with a certain BMI, whether that be high or low or otherwise? Um, 
I'm yeah, like, will we, you refuse to to treat people? Because I know it, there a lot are, of people have been, you know, very hurt. There are people I will refuse to treat. Okay, no mm -hmm. question about that. Now, why would I refuse to treat somebody? Because I have to act in a safe, responsible, and ethical fashion. Okay, so I don't. We're, we're stuck in a strange space because I know that there were clinics in Ireland who had BMI cutoffs and wouldn't even entertain a conversation. Mm. And there were clinics which didn't. And I think the trend is more towards clinics having BMI cutoffs. And if, as that becomes the norm, I think gradually I or therapy for fertility could be seen as an outlier. And, oh, you'll go here. And it's very easy for us to get painted with this brush that we are somehow acting in an unreasonable but that's or not what it's fashion. about it is absolutely not so what you need to do is you need to have a really honest dialogue about the impact of weight on pregnancy on fertility treatment and then you need to progress in that fashion i think you need to work proactively with people i think bmi is one indicator of size but it's not always the best one people carry their weight in different ways and in different areas i'm well, sure like there there's like olympic athletes who well, yes. class now i mean look people go oh the rock is morbidly obese yeah but he's not <laughs> you know but he's not no That's, but bmi is exactly not always, but it, it's yeah. not always now look and i'm not trying to i'm not trying to diminish the impact that mm. these things can have and we work as a team and we work in a very responsible and safe way but I do try to be non-paternalistic. Mm. And I have seen a lot of evidence over the years of healthcare professionals, not just in fertility, but across all areas. of fertility, That woman should not be having children. OK, hang on a minute. And I think we'd all have been guilty in the past of making statements like that. Either she's not socially fit or she's not medically. Fit. I'd be very, very careful with those. It's a hell of a thing to stand in judgment over another human being mm -hmm. and decide what they can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, and modern medicine has moved in this direction, it is not our job to tell people what to do. It's our job to educate and inform and support. Mm -hmm. And that's where we should be. Now, there are limits. I think one of the best ways of putting this is if somebody comes along and says, I want you to transfer five embryos mm -hmm. into me all at once. It's my job to educate and inform that person as to why that's a terrible, terrible idea, why it won't have any practical increase in their overall success rate, why it's very dangerous. If at the end of that conversation they go, I've heard you, I understand you, I still want five embryos put back in, then one of two things has happened. Either they're mad or I'm terrible at my job or, you know, now that's it. So there are lines in the sand that we can't ethically cross. They're quite clear what they are. I am, um, and I do understand that if there was public funding, you can make a much clearer argument that your success rate is so compromised by your weight that we are better served putting our limited resources in this space over there. Mm. It's not the nicest thing in the world to hear, but at least it makes sense. There's there's an economic broader but this conversation. This is a, a private service that uh, someone's paying for. Exactly, and while I fully agree that hospitals run an awful lot better if it wasn't for all the patients in them. You know, it's our job to deliver care, either in a public or a private setting. It is our job to look after the people in front of us as best we can. Now, it's all about informed consent. Mm -hmm. It is all about that person being fully aware. That person understands fully what the risks are. Mm -hmm. And you can really beat them with a stick on that. You really can and go, do you know what? You're very likely to wind up with the cesarean section. You're very likely to wind up with a wound infection. You're very likely to wind up with this problem, that problem, the other problem. You're very likely to wind up with diabetes and all the rest. But a lot of the time, you don't have these problems. And the hospitals are there. And it's not like it'll be a surprise and it'll be planned. And it'll be, you and know. And also beating someone over the head with a stick is not going to help the situation. No, it's not. It's not. It's certainly not going to make them any thinner. But it is vital. And this is important. Because when I say beat the mosaic, there's, there's compassionate ways of doing that. Yeah. There's, there's demonstration that you understand the impact that your words are mm. having on people. Um, that you understand how difficult it is for them to go in there, how brokenhearted they are by all of this. They aren't happy. They aren't happy to be in this situation, you know? Um, but just supporting them with that. But you need to be absolutely sure that they understand yeah. that there are that there are tangible risks that they could perhaps offset by putting time and effort into yeah. weight reduction and things like that. Now, you have to balance that against time, you know? Yeah. But... In, in my experience, um, telling people, I've, oh, geez, 
I think I can count on the fingers of one head the number of cases where they've been told, go away and lose 20 kilos, and they've come back and they've lost 20 kilos. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay? That's not how you get somebody to lose 20 kilos. Yeah. It's just simply not it. You need to work with them. Yeah. Yeah. support them yeah and I think everything you've said there is key it's it's not about being you know yeah. blasé about it it's it's working with people and treating people as human beings yeah and with respect yeah okay um one more cool and we've kind of we've kind of touched on this is is um that a common conception or misconception is that infertility is uh, purely down to the eggs Yes, and of course, as I said earlier, at least half the time there's a male factor mm. in involvement. Um, infertility is associated, tied intimately in with people's feelings of self-worth, mm. who they are as human beings. Um, you see it especially with men and low semen analysis mm. or even like... <laughs> if you tell a woman her ovarian reserve is normal or good she is generally relieved, mm. okay? If you tell a guy he has a high sperm count, it's always exactly the same reaction. Yeah. Get in! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lesson in there, I think. Um, and actually, do you know what? My, you can remember I did my AMH. It came back. You, oh, yes. And funny, I felt exactly that because I, I said I was, in, I was in the clinic and one of the nurses told me and I was like, is that, is that good? Is what? What is that? And apparently, it's good. But I, I felt very proud of myself, and it's ridiculous because, oh, yeah. like, well done, go because of all the work you've put into it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's so ridiculous, but it is. It's really kind of tied up in so, your your feelings of self worth and. So the the best couples, because you do see male factor, you see female factor. The best couples come in as a team. Now, I mean, that's a bit of a woke term. But they are supportive. They're understanding that at any point, either member of the couple may be mm. at a different point on the optimism pessimism curve. They understand that it's not about blame at all. And people say, "Oh, it's not about blame," but secretly, it is. no, it yeah. really, it really isn't. It's guys who get low sperm who get find out they've low sperm count. They tend to drop pretty quickly into solution mode and go, "Right, how do we how do we fix this?" You know, if if you find uh, a, a woman with a very low ovarian reserve, it can be very upsetting. And in truth, the treatment options are worse. Mm. It's easier to treat male fertility. Yeah. Just we're, scientifically, we're better at doing it. It's not fair. It's not right, but it's the way it is. So there's generally much more problem solving that happens on that side. And there's much more counseling and education that happens on this side. And that should tell you a lot as well. But it's... It's very, very, the best couples are the couples who very much not all support in whatever she wants to do, although that is a useful approach. It's people who are just, yeah, look, this is our goal together. And mm -hmm. how do we achieve that goal? Yeah. You know that they're coming in as a unit. Yeah. That's what I like to see. Yeah. Okay. Just because we haven't really talked about this really quickly, we're going to go through what happens if someone wants to come to therapy what is the process oh sure because we haven't even talked oh about my that. god yeah, you know so just really quickly it's a what... great podcast <laughs> done a great job well, episode seven testing Super. <laughs> um, um so like just what is what is the process so you reach out to us the there's two key ways to reach out to us the first is through by phone the second more common one is through the internet you find the website, the website. You, you you hit the get in touch with me or you feel i want an appointment button there's, there's two different buttons like i just want a bit of a see what's going on or i want an appointment yeah so you fill in your consultation form then you get a consultation form uh you it, it'll ask you some we've tried to keep this short and tight i know everybody still thinks it's long but it, we try we've tried to keep this as short as possible your broad strokes medical history both you and your partner and what treatment you're interested and in. what treatment you're interested in which it, the commitment you know it's yeah, just yeah, no, kind it's of just give us a flavor. then what will happen is you'll come in and you'll have a nurse consultation mm -hmm. uh with one of our with our very experienced fertility nurses you won't pay a penny for that um they will break through your history they'll they'll talk it all through they will recommend investigations they will if you have I've done investigation before the more stuff you give us in advance the better off please get your notes get your records send them into us in advance there's no point in giving us 200 pages sitting in the room with us it'll take us too long to go through them all break it all down uh they'll go through 
the recommended tests, they'll talk to you about treatment options, they'll give you access to resources, they'll give you more information. You'll then do your testing, you'll do your bloods, you'll do your scans, your Hycosi semen analysis, whatever it is, and then you'll come and see me. Mm -hmm. uh, then we'll have a chat. At that stage, you'll probably have a pretty good idea of what you want to do. I'll either support or not, depending on the results of the tests and the investigations and all the rest. Then we'll make a plan and you can progress. The fastest A to B to C to get into treatment, you're probably talking about six weeks at the from seeing first initial consult to me to cycle to egg collection six weeks at a minimum. But that's really, really fast. Wait, hang on. Six weeks from like having Theor your nurse consultation to having an egg collection. Yeah, that's theoretically. very quick. Yeah, theoretically. Yeah, we could. We could. Now, it doesn't always work like that because yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. tests are dependent on cycles mm -hmm. and things like that. But we don't have a waiting list at the moment. Watch this space. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so what we're trying to do is educate and then give people options and mm. they can hit the big red button on their treatment when they're ready. Yeah doesn't mean you have to do it it means you can cool awesome oh. um so john how was your how was your first podcast experience i i do you know um <clears throat> i've been thinking back on it a lot and i would love to be able to take the first 10 minutes of each podcast and just cut it out now you can't because <laughs> it doesn't make any practical sense but as they were i think i waffle an awful lot I've listened to it a bit. It's tough hearing. You've listened back? A little bit. You said you weren't going to do that. I shouldn't have. <laughs> 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 nah, nobody's, nobody likes the sound of their own voice. But some, some people do. Jesus, I, I ramble occasionally. Well, I think... I, I blame you. No, just, just blame Renee for everything. <laughs> I mean, I think this series has been great and hopefully it's been helpful to people exactly. who are either considering treatment, who are going through treatment, who are reflecting on treatment that they've had... Yeah. Um, and it's just been, you know, honest and open and I think to we've the point. done that much. I think we've done that much. I don't think I've been uh, political about it. I think it's been great from that perspective. Yeah. 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 It's been great to have the platform. It's been great to get it out there. So it's, it's a resource. People can draw on and listen yeah. as they and need to. Yeah. And speaking of resources, just to remind people that we have weekly Instagram lives now. Which oh, that's is right. Yes. Very exciting. Yes. Um, and a monthly webinar. Yes. And those are always happening on a Tuesday. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, I mean, dial in on them. Um, I think, and, and, and going forward, what I want to do is bring, I know you feel the same, we load more voices to sure. the table here. I and want experts to, on different yeah, topics. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Because I'm fully aware of, of, of what I know about and what I don't know. Uh, yeah. And I'm always going to be trying to study courses of that. So I'd love to get those people. Involved. Yeah, so keep different perspectives. Keep, keep your ears peeled for Thank season two. Thank you very much for now. It's been you. a pleasure.